I was first introduced to the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program at Delta State University in Cleveland, Mississippi, where they were conducting a panel discussion on local civil rights activism. I was hooked. Then and there, I became an SPOHP groupie, attending, supporting, promoting, praising, all things associated with the program. I cannot say how many panel discussions I attended, but I can say that I was spellbound each time. They made it a pleasure to learn the wealth of the knowledge they provided, the depth of their commitment, and the enthusiasm they demonstrated always created a welcome air of excitement. When the oral history program agreed to come to Vicksburg, Mississippi to conduct interviews on local civil rights activists in the 60s and 70s, I was elated. Vicksburg is well known for its Confederate history and somewhat known for its reconstruction history, but there is no documented record of its civil rights history, of which there is plenty. What an honor and opportunity to have the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program conduct interviews in Vicksburg as part of their field research. Publicity was done and the response was overwhelming, so much so that the team had to conclude the interviews the following year. Several of those interviewed played key roles in the movement decades ago and have recently passed on, so I am especially grateful that their stories have been preserved for future generations. In addition to their interviews, the research team also recorded video footage of the historic Beulah Cemetery as part of a documentary about cemeteries. There was also a presentation on incorporating and teaching African American history in high school. Last but not least, there were team members themselves. What a fabulous group. How Dr. Ortiz can assemble such an efficient, cohesive group of individuals devoted to a single cause is beyond comprehension. Not only that, there are some of the nicest, most personable, and thoughtful people you'll ever meet. They, too, were a hit. The entire town is still asking if and when they will be back. Because there was not enough time to interview everyone who expressed interest, the team carved out a little time the following summer to finish up the interviews. Dr. Ortiz assembled another delightful and well-informed team to conduct interviews and to lead panel discussions. It was during this time that Dr. Ortiz did his book discussion in African American and Latinx History of the United States and book signing at Laura Lee Bookstore in Vicksburg. The attentive audience followed up with the thought-provoking questions and lively discussion. A most rewarding time was enjoyed by all. The Samuel Proctor Oral History Project encourages growth and understanding of and within our community through firsthand accounts of individual experiences that cannot be obtained elsewhere. It is through these personal narratives that enable us to more fully comprehend the facts of our written history and therefore more fully comprehend our place within that history. The value of such information is beyond measure. Written by Georgine Clark, read by Imaya Munjin. Hi, my name is Diana Dombrowski. I was a field researcher with the Mississippi Freedom Project from 2012 to 2015, during a period where it was growing a great deal and was led and coordinated by Sarah Blanc in partnership with a Sunflower County Civil Rights Organization. One of the most meaningful experiences for me was getting to learn from Margaret Block. She led us on tours of the Delta every year and those tours were unforgettable. She was hilarious, an amazing poet, and had a devastatingly sharp wit that I still recall when I am facing personal or professional problems and wondering what the best thing to do is. And I carry her memory with me because she drives home in every way what the right thing is to do. And I was so moved by her example of hard work and daring and courage. And um, I'm really grateful to have learned from her. It was also hugely fun and rewarding to travel with people who became my friends year after year to the same place, getting to know the people there getting to serve the goals of a group in the Delta. We weren't parachuting in. We were helping to record voices that we'd been asked to by a group who was already there and who is established. We were supplementing and complementing, and it was reciprocal to their efforts 
to memorialize what civil rights veterans did in the Delta there. The true effort and depth of devotion that civil rights veterans showed in their lives is really bearing fruit. It was a great privilege to be able to record and document some of those outcomes, especially the Sunflower County um, Freedom Project. Talking to those kids was really special. So. Good evening. On behalf of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at the University of Florida, welcome to UF and the Mississippi Delta Public Program. My name is Paul Ortiz. I'm a professor of history and director of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program since 2008, when we launched UF in the Mississippi Delta Public Program known as MFP. You'll hear a lot of um, letters tonight. MFP stands for Mississippi Freedom Project. At the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, we often say that journeys begin here. And tonight we're gonna to take a journey that's talking about many different journeys. We just heard from Dinah Dabrowski, a UF alumna who was one of the leaders of the UF and Mississippi Delta Project for four years. We also heard from Ms. Georgine Clark, who was a longtime faculty member um, at, in, in Cleveland, Mississippi at Delta State University. And Georgine became one of our community hosts and in Vicksburg, Mississippi. And tonight you're gonna to hear from UF students, alumni, uh, community organizers, community hosts in Mississippi Delta who made, who've made this entire odyssey since 2008 possible. Uh, there's a lot of people I'm gonna be thanking throughout tonight's program. I wanna start though by thanking my dear colleagues, uh, Stephanie Baer and Steve Evans from the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences Office of Advancement and alumni affairs. Um, Stephanie and Steve were really the catalysts uh, behind tonight's event and really uh, suggesting that we, we do the program. Uh, I also wanna thank my colleague, Dean Dave Richardson, uh, the Dean of Liberal Arts and Sciences. And I want to right now kind of, and again, I'll be thanking folks throughout tonight. It's, in a, it's an emotional night for me because I'm seeing a lot of um, my former students uh, who have uh, graduated um, and uh, who are returning this evening. So if you see me get a little teary-eyed, um, that's just gonna be part of the program. But again, on behalf of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program, College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and UF, welcome to the UF and the Mississippi Delta Public Program. Uh, we are in for a real treat this evening. Hi everyone, my name is Damia Foster and I attended the University of Florida from the years of 2010 to 2014. During my freshman year, I got the opportunity to attend the annual SPOP trip to the Mississippi Delta where I got to meet Margaret Block. And this is during my freshman year with PhD students, individuals who this is their career as well as have a passion for. And I was just very new to it, very new to ex the experience, but it was granted it to me and I took it. And I'm very grateful that I, that I took that chance to go learn with these amazing people as well as meet the legendary Margaret Block. For me, my perspective will have to be that every individual, and every student should get this opportunity. With the education system we have in our country, there's not a lot of truth being told about the true history of America and the true Black American experience as well as history in this country. So to be able to have that firsthand, be able to hear the true stories, be able to hear what they did in order to make our country what it is today and what we're hoping it will become more of um, was very impactful for me and really changed the way that I see history, really changed my experience as a Black woman in this country and 
as well as impacted the way that I share my history and the pride that I have behind my history with my family and my friends. Peace and blessings, y'all, at the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program of the University of Florida. My person is so happy to be able to make a few comments about how your Mississippi Delta program has helped to record and document most valuable modern civil and human rights history by on each occasion filming live interviews of the persons who were the actual makers of the history and the events. My person has spent the last 25 years intensively leading an advocacy equal history program aimed at preservation of America's domestic slave trade from the upper Old South down to the Southwest via chattel sla slavery selling markets at Natchez, Mississippi. And concurrently implementing annual living history programs about the roles and history of self-emancipated runaway and slaves who served as freedom fighters in the Union Army during the Civil War. SPOHP was a God-sent blessing for my person here in Hidden History, Mississippi. Y'all provided the kind of progressive-minded and brave folks much needed to capture the modern civil rights history and personalities that lay dominant and dying in both Mississippi and Louisiana. It was a pleasure to work with UF students of multicultural and racial origins from across the world, just like my person had been used to doing for 35 years living in California. Staff was the same, and both students and staff made for a social justice movement of the kind my person teamed up with to rescue endangered humanity and history via SPOHP. Written by Sir Sesh Ab Hetir C.M. Boxley. Read by Cedric Sawyer. Hi, my name is Brianne Palmer and I'm a 2013 graduate of the University of Florida and I was on the 2011 trip to the Mississippi Delta with the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. That trip changed my life, it radicalized me, and it brought everything I was learning in the classroom to life. I remember meeting the late Margaret Block who taught us about her role in SNCC and about being a freedom singer and about freedom songs. And I will never forget being able to spend so much time with her while she was with us in this life. And I still have a copy of Their Eyes Are Watching God that she signed for me as a gift. Um, and so I can't describe how important the Mississippi Delta trip was to me personally, to my development as a student, as a person, and now as a lawyer doing immigration work, specifically work for black immigrants. So thank you so much to SPOP. Thank you to Dr. Ortiz. Thank you to everyone who has been involved with the Mississippi Delta trip. And I'm looking forward to more years and more memories of these incredible trips and these amazing experiences. Thank you. Thank you, Brianne. I'd like to describe a little bit about what we've been watching so far. We've been seeing UF alumni, alumna talk about their experiences in the Mississippi Delta. Uh, we've heard Georgine Clark, we've heard uh, Sir Boxley from Natchez, Mississippi, uh, talking about how they in first invited the oral history program out to the Mississippi Delta to do oral history field work. And I wanna talk a little bit about the origins of the project before we move on to our first uh, live panel, um, as it were. So a major theme of the Mississippi Freedom Project is to explore the intergenerational journey and struggle for full, full civil rights and human rights for all people. But that's easier said than done, right? How do we teach each other how to get free and how to respect each other's humanity? How do we model small d democracy? How do we learn how to promote the ideals of civic engagement, mutual aid, concern from one's neighbor, uh, neighbors, uh, respect for other people's histories? To me, going to the Mississippi Delta when I was a graduate student in the mid 1990s was really a wake up call. Um, it blew my mind uh, in, in, every, in every possible way. It actually started in Northern Florida. Um, I was a graduate student at Duke University. I was a research assistant for a project called Behind the Veil, documenting African-American life in the Jim Crow South. It was funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Thank you, NEH. And I remember showing up in the Florida Panhandle in the summer of 1994. 
It was the summer after the Rosewood compensation hearings where survivors of one of the worst uh, anti-Black massacres in U.S. history gave their testimony. It was an amazing time. I met Mrs. Laura and Sam Dixie Sr., and they were incredible freedom fighters. They had hosted Dr. King in their house. They had defended him from harm. Um, they were organizers with the Tallahassee bus boycott in 1956. Uh, they literally adopted me. They showed me how to get in contact with African-American elders uh, in the Tallahassee community. From there, I went to the Mississippi Delta and I met this incredible individual by the name of Dorsey White, who ran uh, White's uh, service station in Indianola, Mississippi. I was lost, frankly, uh, asking for directions. I remember asking Mr. White, um, uh, he asked me, uh, young man, what are you doing here? You know, usually people don't get lost, you know, coming to Indianola. I said, well, sir, I'm looking to interview civil rights movement veterans. Uh, and he said, son, I got a whole list of people for you to talk to. And it's so thrilling to me uh, over two decades later to be able to work with the children and grandchildren of Laura and Sam Dixie Sr., of Dorsey White Sr., because these are the people who invited us in back into the Mississippi, Mississippi Delta to try to tell their stories and to educate the entire nation and the world that the Mississippi Delta is really the foundation stone of the modern civil rights movement. So before I move on to the next panel, I do want to thank uh, another dear colleague in the College of Liberal Arts uh, Office of Development, Meredith Palmberg. She was a, really a critical uh, architect of this evening's um, event. So thank you so much, Meredith. So our first panel, um, and again, I mentioned before, I might get a little teary-eyed uh, welcoming back so many uh, former students, uh, but we're welcoming back two amazing um, former leaders of the Mississippi Freedom Project, uh, Marna Weston and Naila Summers. And they'll kind of introduce themselves, but I do want to say that both of them are incredible teachers. Uh, Naila, Summer, Naila Summers has worked as communication director for um, the Dream Defenders of Florida. And Marna Weston uh, is an amazing uh, debate and, uh, a coach uh, and also teaches at Oak Hall uh, Academy. So without further delay, um, I will turn the panel over to Marna and Naila. And the theme is what we call in the oral history uh, program, the Margaret Block effect. Naila, you wanna go on? I, I haven't seen you in a minute. It's so wonderful to see you. Just so much love, so many great memories like Paul was talking about. It's been a month of Sundays. <laughs> we should just go ahead and do it like, um, like Margaret would do it. This little light of mine, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let, it shine. let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I guess Zoom doesn't didn't let us up get all the harmony and the time together. <sighs> You, know, you can't start something without, uh, you know, with Margaret without talking about the song. I remember her and Hollis, like the first time we got together in Mississippi, it was like, well, y'all need to start singing. We need to do something. She was, uh, you know, such power, such love. And uh, I'm sorry, I went on. I was singing. I'd open it up to you first. You go ahead. Oh, no, no. <laughs> I was going to let you have it. You were, you set the tone, man, honestly. Like that, that was just such a, knowing that we were doing that in the spirit of, of Margaret uh, was really touching. And now I need a second to collect myself. So Marna, you go for it before I start having a- right, I'll take that time back from you. We'll pass it around. I, I guess the whole thing is from meeting Margaret at the very beginning, she was just family. She was powerful family. She, she, put, she put people in their place. I remember I went to Mississippi the first time with Paul because uh, you know I met Bob Zeger, he introduced me to Paul. I'm like, okay, let's do some things. Let's go on a trip. I thought I was doing the Marna Western project. I didn't know it was the, the Mississippi Freedom Project. I was like, this is going to be the Martin Western project, but I met, uh, you know, I met Margaret in that, in that way that she does, and she, she's the international ambassador of everywhere. I mean, whether it was Glendora, whether it was Cleveland, I remember Billy Knoll, the mayor of Cleveland, um, brought us into his house, and uh, Margaret was just telling me, you better have done something good for us like this. <laughs> <laughs> you knew everybody, Definitely. everybody. I took a solo trip to the Delta, and uh, Maybe it was 2012, 2011, around the time of my birthday, and I, I was looking for 
you know, a place to be able to rest while I was doing the resources. She said, let me get Billy on the phone. He called Delta State. They set something up for me. You know, Margaret just, she, um, she believed in people. Oh, and she talked about the University of Florida too. I remember because she didn't get a golf cart when she needed one. She was here. She said, how old black woman is supposed to walk around this campus? And they don't have a, a golf cart for me. So she was, she was clear and crisp about everything. I mean, nobody, nobody got away. And she made sure that she showed up. She loved me down. She really did. I mean, she, she, she just made me a part of her. Took me over to her cousin's house. <laughs> Those cousins were out of control. I just, I remember so many good things about her and about how she empowered all of us just to be in her space, whether it was in her home, which was also, you know, the Sam Block Museum, you know, that her brother had, uh, had she had dedicated that to the intellectual study of snake and its activities in her home. And so many young people would just sit around on the floor and listen to her at all times at night. Um, whether it's going out to, you know, airport grocery, you remember airport grocery? <laughs> and the senator's place, I'm talking a lot about food. So you guys know me, I'm, I'm doing that. But I you know, I also remember going out to uh, to Mount Bayou and uh, talking to Benny Thompson and that, that Taborian Hospital, which, you know, Margaret's interest in focusing us on that led to improvements in that place. It's now more of a historic site. They put some money and some time into it. When we first saw it, it had really decayed. And, uh, you know, I think that, you know, her type of influence just, just changed people. It made them think about what it was they thought was important. And you got to realize you know, if you thought you were important and you were in her presence, she would remind you that mm -hmm. everybody's small. You know, you're not, you're not that big. You know, you, know, you, you don't look that big to me. <laughs> you, uh, you ready to come in yet? <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, I'm just thinking, I, I'm, I'm reminiscing. I think one of the things that struck me so much so far is that how similar all of our stories were. Uh, my first trip was with Brienne. She's in the chat talking about us going to Walmart at night. Uh, I was on Damia's first trip. I went twice uh, to Mississippi. And, you know, we just, she was such a big person to us. Um, and so I'll, I'll say Margaret, knowing Margaret changed my life, like absolutely a thousand percent. Um, so again, I'm, I'm Naila Summers, um, an OG of SPOP. Uh, I went to the Mrs. I went on the Mississippi Delta trip in 2011 and 2012, um, around the same time that I co-founded Dream Defenders. Uh, Dream Defenders was born um, out of the murder of Trayvon Martin in February 2012, and I met Margaret a year before that. Right, like um, meeting Margaret, going to the Delta, getting involved in Spock, meeting, uh, uh, knowing Dr. Ortiz, taking his class, like this all sort of culminated in where I am in my life right now. Um, you know, the, the whole experience and knowing her, like just, it, it set me on a path. Um, and I had to pull out my artifacts of which I have many I've discovered. Um, but you know, the first time we met, we met Margaret was September 21st, 2011. Uh, and loved her instantly. Uh, Marna, you mentioned the, the Sam Block Jr. Civil Rights Foundation, right? Like the hand painted side on her front porch, you just, you knew what it was gonna be as soon as you walked in. Um, and you know, the inside of her house was red, she had black art. I remember going, um, she had like a little section in the house right off the kitchen and she had like a collection of vaudeville stuff, right? I'd never seen a black person own these things. And I got the opportunity to ask her later, like why, <laughs> like that's such a, you know, pickaninnies and, and like, why, right? She said it was a reminder, like, don't ever forget um, what our history is, right? It's like every single part. And I think if you had to boil it down, you can't boil Margaret down, but like she was a teacher, right? She was a historian. She wanted everybody to know the way that the world worked and like the realities of the world as it is. Um, and to also have hope, right? But, um, I, I wanted, right, like her influences. I found this at a garage sale and I think of it, I keep it in my kitchen, off my kitchen, like she did. Um, and you know, Margaret was a poet, a historian, an organizer. She would talk to everybody. The way that Marna said that she could call anybody up, she talked to everybody, whether you had time to listen or not, she would make you listen, right? And I remember there was one time I think when we were leaving the Emmett Till, the, the Essex Museum, where she was thirsty, she wanted drinks, we pulled over, and she just started talking to all the guys that were hanging outside. And I was just like, oh, shit, she's not, oh, excuse me. <laughs> she's not, you know, she's just, she is a woman of the people. Um, and, you know, so she was just this, this character, this, like, I think 
setting up for this, I realized just how much uh, Margaret means to me. When I was little, um, I used to explore things a lot. Uh, I would go through all my grandma's photo albums. I would go through like just old letters that she would keep. And so I don't know what point in my life I started saving things for my kids to go through one day when I do have children. And I have this box and like, I, I was like, I need to go find all my Margaret things and just realize like Margaret has a folder in my life box. Um, you know, she, I have here like one of her poems, one of her poems that she has addressed to me. I've got the first, the itinerary of our first Delta, of my first Delta trip in 2011. I've got uh, cutouts of when we brought her to the University of Florida. I've got Samuel Block's uh, obituary, right? Like I just, Margaret was just such a force. And I think whether I realize it every day day or not, I think she really, she set me on a path and I've spent the last 10 years uh, trying to be a person who teaches people about the world and all the things that have been with, the, you know, the, that have been done to us and all the things that we've accomplished um, and fighting for a better world because that's who she was. And, and yeah, just preparing for this made me realize that like she had so much to do with that. Um, I'm listening to you. Yeah. You said how she was. I still feel that she's with us. I mean, she's never left us. Whenever I think about justice and jive, I mean, the entire Trump administration, I thought about Margaret every single day. I know she would just love to get on that train. <laughs> I also think, you know, so much about, you know, how we went out to Glendora and different places, like you just said, and she would, the, the leaders of the areas would just come and surround us and be involved with her. Uh, because uh, they knew that you know, there was there was no joke if Margaret we must have been okay if she brought us to learn with her it was an automatic she was a walking passport for justice and inclusion because Ooh, yes. of her you were just you you know you were part of the group and uh, there's definitely a part of our lives missing to not have have her with us anymore and uh, I don't know I'm just really pleased to um, to see you this um, this makes the whole thing and to see, uh, you know, Davia. I remember she was in my my summer class when she decided to come take that trip. So, really, I mean, look, I mean, look at how she just, you know, turned into the person that she is. Um, Paul, you planted some good seeds with us. I, I, I would just say, um, uh, continue to think on Margaret and her memory, and uh, continue to plant seeds. I'm so proud of you too. I mean, the, that whole. The whole thing you did in Tallahassee, you know, you made them change the rules. It used to be people could hang out in the lobby, but y'all. <laughs> <laughs> we sent we sent some young people to Tallahassee today to fight something. Yeah, yeah, they pulled the okie doke. They said, "Oh, we can't let them stay here in the lobby anymore." But um, and I want to thank Paul too for 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 planting the seeds that put us all on the path to meet each other. Um, Absolutely. So there are too many powerful stories even to share. I'm just honored to be here tonight and to share a few words with you, and to, just to see you. Just you know, good to see you. Good to see you, Marna. Good to see everybody. Appreciate being here so much. But it's just that I think I missed, I didn't miss that college, that whole experience being on campus and hanging out and partying all night mm -hmm. and pledging you know being in these little sororities mm -hmm. and stuff some of my friends now be sitting around talking about oh what did you pledge my i tell them all the time i pledge snick all right <laughs> they know what i'm talking about they deltas and aka right right <laughs> i'm telling them well i pledge snick okay uh -huh. I'm saying, well, you should have, you my age, you should have been in SNCC too instead of wasting your time with a sorority. What y'all do? Nothing. September was amazing. If you know about Ella Baker, mm -hmm. then she's a kind of an Ella Baker. Because mm -hmm. she was in North Car South Carolina, in the Carolinas, the Sea Island and all of that. And it was her idea to have citizenship schools. It, that was her idea, and nobody ever talk about uh, September Clark, Miss mm -hmm. Clark. Mm -hmm. Wow, so thank you so much, Marna and Naila, for helping us remember the importance of Margaret Block 
Tonight, we're talking about intergenerational dialogues, intergenerational freedom dialogues. Margaret Block grew up in the Mississippi Delta. Uh, as a young woman, she was a project director for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. You'll hear the term SNCC quite a bit tonight. Uh, SNCC was one of the most important civil rights organizations in American history. And Margaret was actually our guide. She, Marta, I think mentioned wherever Margaret took us, the walls kind of came tumbling down. Uh, people throughout the Delta had such a respect for Margaret Block that if she took us to, to interview a group of elders, if she took us into a church, if she took us into a, a, a fraternity hall, um, people respected her. And so we're just so grateful for the work that Margaret Block did with us. Uh, we brought her to the University of Florida and she did a poetry reading um, and just had such a big impact. But I just love the fact that in many ways, the UF and the Mississippi Delta trip, in, in a sense, retraces the steps of those courageous student on violent coordinating uh, uh, committee uh, SNCC organizers. Uh, people like Charlie Cobb, uh, people like Fannie Lou Hamer, people like John Lewis, people like Julian Bond. Those are the steps that we're trying to retrace and to talk about and to remind people about. Um, I wanna make a couple announcements before I introduce the next uh, portion of our program. Uh, we will be doing a Q&A um, at the end of tonight's session, which will run a little more than an hour. And so if you wanna stick on and ask questions of any of the attendees, um, please do. We'll look forward to, to talking uh, with you. So now we turn to some new testimonials. And I wanted to kind of preview these testimonials for you. Uh, we'll hear from a former UF student who's reflect, uh, her name is Cheyenne and she's reflecting on her experiences in the Delta. We'll also hear from a teacher, an award-winning teacher, Flan McDaniel, who when we worked with her was a teacher in Macomb, Mississippi School District. And Macomb, if you are familiar with the civil rights movement and hey, attorney, Dr. Attorney John Dew, I know you're out there and uh, Dr. Professor Gwilin Zohara Simmons, uh, I wanna mention that attorney, uh, Dr. John Dew and Zohar Simmons, who I'm just so uh, privileged with to, to have been a colleague with for many years at UF, we would give, uh, they would give lectures, uh, John Dew and, and Zohar Simmons about what it was like to be in SNCC in the early 1960s. And they would help prepare our students. It was very important for me as a professor to make sure our students were prepared before they even got on the vans to go to Mississippi, that they knew how to ask good questions, that they knew basic components of the history of the civil rights movement. So people like Zohar Simmons, people like John Dew, uh, people like Professor Larry Rivers, when we'd stop over in Tallahassee, and we'd spend half a day in the home of Mrs. Uh, and Mr. Uh, uh, Laura and Sam Dixie. And uh, now we'll turn to uh, two student testimonials uh, and also the testimonial of Flan McDaniel, who was a teacher at Macomb School District in Mississippi that we, we work with. And so, yeah, this trip was very impactful for me because I learned um, not only what like field work looked like, but really understanding how history plays a part in these people's everyday lives. Um, and also seeing how field work, when you do it, it should be in community and with community. I think one of the things that Dr. Ortiz had very much stressed to our uh, cohort was that if you do field work, we don't, like, SPOP does field work in communities that ask that we be there, right? We shouldn't be going to communities we think that are cool and just doing the work without really working with the community and giving them access to the things that we do, right? In Natchez, we were working directly with them to find, like, these documents, to help them archive things, and it's really important that when we like help them with their history, like we give them access to the things that they that, that is theirs. I think specifically with Mississippi and the Mississippi Delta, there's this history of a lot of people coming in trying to understand what's going on, doing these documentaries, and then the people of the Mississippi Delta just get like nothing. They don't get any money from these like documentaries. They don't get access to any of the interviews that they were part of. And that's really like a shame to those communities, right? They give you access to their story. And I think that this trip does a really good job of not only giving people the outlet to tell their story, but actually having access to that story so that the community can use it for their own good um, outside of what SWAP does, right? 
Um, and so I think that those were just a couple of the things that are um, that I saw that I think would be really important for or a benefit to people who are interested in this trip. So, yeah. It was indeed a pleasure to have worked with the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. When we were in the planning stages of developing a project to share oral history in McCall, Mississippi, we flew out to Florida to get a better overview of how Dr. Ortiz and his staff had developed the program. Dr. Ortiz and staff provided the guidance and support we needed to get the McComb Legacies Project off the ground and running. Our collaboration with the Samuel Proctor or History Program led to the success of the Macomb Legacies Project, leading students to compete on a national level sharing or history. It was also an honor to have received the Martha Ross Teaching Award for the work we did in collaboration with the Samuel Proctor or History Program. This would not have been possible without the guidance and support from the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. Falana McDaniel, Macomb Legacies Project, Macomb, Mississippi. Hello, my name is Chelsea Carnes. I am an UF alumni, SPOP alumni, I attended the and participated in the um, 2013 Mississippi Delta oral history trip. And um, I, it was an incredibly formative, amazing experience for me. Um, I got to meet civil rights activists who de devoted their lives um, to fighting for equality in the South. I met people like Margaret Block. I remember I was one of the only people on the trip who was old enough to drive the rental car so I got to go pick her up and drop her off and spend one-on-one -on -one time with her and I just so fascinated by her life and the um, her legacy and, um, and and just hearing firsthand stories of of what people went through to, to fight for equal rights in the south um, it was a trip that could be fun goofing off in the car talking about music uh, learning about Dr. Ortiz's taste in hip-hop and it was a very long car ride uh, we got to know each other well um, but it could also be, uh, it was a trip that could be devastating. We visited the Emmett Till Museum. We learned about um, some of the real horror and, and terrible history of, uh, of events that have taken place in the South. Um, it was a trip uh, that allowed students to have professional experience collecting oral histories. Um, we were firsthand meeting and talking to people who'd lived through an incredible time um, collecting histories that without oral history and the process of oral history collection might never be heard um, and bringing those back to, to Gainesville to store in the oral history collection at the University of Florida. So um, it was just a, an incredible experience on many levels. I'd recommend SPOP and this experience and others like it that SPOP provides to, to anyone. It was great for me. I've gone on to become an educator myself um, after uh, after my experiences with SPOP and got my master's and now now I teach um, and I uh, I am affected and better for the experiences I had at the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program and uh, particularly my experience visiting the Mississippi Delta. Thanks. Thank you, Fulana, Chelsea, and Cheyenne. And as Cheyenne mentioned, UF and the Mississippi Delta, we only go to places where we are invited. And there are so many ongoing history projects in the Mississippi, uh, Mississippi Delta. Fulana McDaniel mentioned uh, the Macomb Project. And so there we partnered with Macomb High School to help teach basic oral history techniques um, and brought our, our techniques from UF to Macomb, Mississippi. Uh, and I have to mention oral history is, we engage what we call dialogical learning. That is, we learn from the communities that we work in. We learn their histories. Um, they learn, but we are mutually creating knowledge. That is, we're learning together, we're listening, right? 
So the Macomb Legacy Project was a very important project that taught students how to do oral histories in the civil rights movement. At the same time, it taught them how to do uh, very sophisticated audio and video production um, uh, uh, using the most advanced software at, at the time. Uh, we're also frequently called in to work with museum groups in the Mississippi Delta to help them build oral history collections, or as was mentioned earlier, to help them digitize or archive or process papers, right? We do days of service um, in local historically African-American cemeteries, um, uh, just you know, clipping grass, you know, helping to clean the grounds. Uh, a little later tonight, we'll hear from our dear colleague, uh, Mary Olson, and colleagues from the Elaine Legacy Center. Uh, we were invited there two years ago to help commemorate and document the 100th anniversary of the Elaine Massacre and a horrific uh, event that took place in 1919. So I wanted to emphasize and, and reflect on what our students said earlier in our alumni, that we don't just kind of go barging into a community or group. And we also do it in small groups, right? We don't want to overwhelm communities. And so uh, it's been such a blessing to be able to work with with the Mississippi Freedom Project. Um, and I'll talk a little more about some of our other collaborations uh, as the evening uh, continues. And, but now it's my great pleasure and honor to be able to introduce our next live panel. Uh, we have two tremendous discussants, uh, Omar Sanchez, who is a uh, senior at the University of Florida and was uh, our trip co-coordinator uh, uh, co um, for the Mississippi Freedom Project and Professor Justin Hosby, who, who before he was uh, a famous professor, uh, was a graduate student at UF that went with us and who engaged in, and I'm very um, grateful for Justin's mentorship of our undergraduates and his tremendous leadership. So um, uh, Professor Hosby and Mr. Sanchez, I'll uh, turn it over to, to you. Thank you, Dr. Ortiz. And, um... It's great to be here, and I just the there should be to Margaret Block. I just had to speak on that really quickly. Just almost brought me to tears, and just I miss Margaret Block so much. She was so important to the trip, and just she transformed similar to how she transformed Naila's life. She transformed my life as well. So just to want to say that to to Margaret Block. Omar, I'm, I'm so sure if you want to go ahead. Um, I think for particularly for us, I think one of the most amazing experiences that I had while working um, with the Senior Project Oral History Program was honestly the interview I did with Anthony Ray Henson in 2015. Um, and you may have seen Anthony Henson. He was actually in the Just Mercy. Uh, he was depicted in the Just Mercy film um, that came out from about Brian Stevenson, Equal, Equal Justice Initiative, um, that came out last year, I believe. Um, but he was depicted there. And there's a bit at the end of the, the film, there's a short kind of story about his life and what happened. But that interview was conducted by, it was myself, um, my brother, Derek Gomez, um, Brittany King, um, and, and for us, and Brittany Mejia as well, Brittany Mejia. And part of it was just trying to understand at this moment in time, Anthony Hinton had been incarcerated unjustly for 30 years. Um, he was on death row for the majority of the time that he was actually incarcerated. Um, and he was, he had been ex exonerated and, and gotten out of um, prison I believe about six months prior to our interview with him. So he was really, really fresh in terms of just recollecting his, his experience and talking about what the transition was like leaving leaving jail and leaving prison and then going back into um, you know, his his normal life with his family again. And the interview was transformative for me because in many ways he talked about the trauma that he experienced number one, being a solitary confinement for the majority of that time. And that's where I began to really understand and think about just the history of solitary confinement in this country. And of course, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, the things that predate that going back into slavery, but thinking about the form of torture that we allow in our society by allowing solitary confinement to kind of be, um, you know, be a way that we kind of incarcerate people. And but what struck me throughout the entire interview with, with, with Mr. Hinton was at the end of the interview, he had no malice. He had very little anger in his heart. All he had was compassion. And I think that what I understood from that was he said that, you know, I've spent so much of my life, you know, facing the trauma of being incarcerated unjustly and kind of being, you know, at the forefront of a system that tried to chew him up and spit him out. And he said that at this point in my life, I just have to give back. I just have to think about how can I contribute to make sure that other, you know, young black youth don't have, what happened to me doesn't happen to them as well. 
So he was committed to doing that work with the EJI and he worked with the Equal Justice Initiative, you know, um, at when he, when he got out of prison, but just seeing his life and seeing, you know, if you can Google him now, you can look at everything now on YouTube to see him speaking, but he's just an amazing person. It was really, thank you, Dr. Ortiz for, you know, just for, you know, the trip to Mississippi. And that was in Montgomery, Alabama, actually, but it was amazing to be there and the chance to actually interview and learn from Mr. Hinton was, was really powerful. Yeah, speaking about the Equal Justice Initiative, I actually, before I went on the trip, I didn't really understand what was so bad about the prison system until I went to e, uh, EJI, you know? I think going through that museum, you start to realize like how everything's systematic and, you know, it's a really messed up system that's trying to keep us down. Um, so I'm glad you mentioned it. Um, an interview I did was actually in Arkansas is with this guy named Minister Sukara. He was also known as Sweet Willie Wine. And I love talking about Sweet Willie Wine. He's one of my favorite interviews and I've done so many interviews over the years. Um, so this interview was like two hours long, but I promise you if I could have been there for like five more hours, I probably still would have been talking to him. It was me, Sam Cristani, she's actually here on the panel as well, Elizabeth, uh, Liana, and then I think Megan Sam was there as well, Deborah filming. Um, and it was the most enlightening, I guess, interview for me, just because Sweet so Willie Wine came from like a different background. Like he, was an activist, like a young activist, someone who kind of wasn't respected at first because he came from prison. But when he got out, like he, he came out and he's like, I want to change stuff. I want to make a difference. So he got involved in the Poor People's Campaign in Memphis. And he's actually there shortly after um, Dr. King was assassinated. And he kind of took that up. And he also became a leader within um, a black power group called the Invaders. And he was known as being an organizer for young people in all of Arkansas. And he was such a menace to white supremacy, they made a law after him. It's called the Sweet Willie Wine Law. And it prevented people from organizing. And I just thought that was the coolest thing in the world. Like, how can you be such, how can you do so much that they have to make a law and name it after you? Like, I feel like if I had a law about me like that, I would be, I'd be over the moon. But also it goes to show that like white supremacy is still around and it's trying to keep us down and trying to stop us from organizing and protesting, you know, learning this kind of stuff. So going to the Mississippi, you really don't want to like learn, like going to, before going to the Mississippi, you don't really learn about like any of this kind of history. Like I didn't know Sweet Willie Wine and like I actually Googled him and people are like, oh, I thought he was dead in 2010. I met him in 2019. So like, people don't really know who he is. And I think that's a shame. And it's this experiential kind of learning that you just don't get anywhere else besides SPOP and the MFP trip, you know? You know, Sweet Willie Wine is like someone I'm never gonna forget. Like he taught me like there are history that you just don't learn in school. Like I didn't learn about any of this stuff until I went to Dr. Ortiz's class. I didn't get in Dr. Ortiz's class until I was a junior. I didn't get to learn about it till like I came to SPOP. So, you know, I think our panel is kind of called learning from justice. I think we're learning in one way because we're actually learning what civil rights activists went through and like learning from them, like from their voices and hearing all those stories is something different you just can't get from a book. But I also think it's inspiring to us, the next generation, because like, you know, there's still work to be done, there's push for reform and like, this is on us now. But. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's, that was an important lesson. I think that we all learned um, in going to the, in, in Montgomery to the EJI, we also got a chance to go to um, several other civil rights sites in Montgomery at the time. And so they're probably lost in there being another one of them. And I think what I, what I really learned from doc, from, you know, Mr. Hinton's story for the most part really was to think about, you know, how did you still move in a way that I think you mentioned Omar, just a minister of white supremacy. So be a minister of white supremacy. Um, but there's a way to do that full of kind of compassion and love at the same time and kind of in, in righteousness. And I think that, you know, I think interviewing Mr. Hinton, he was he was he was not the most kind of, you know, exuberant or he was not the, the loudest person in the room, but you could feel his heart um, literally when you spoke with him. And I think that's one thing about the interview. And I think maybe other people who are there um, can speak to that as well. Just you could really get a sense that this person had been treated unfairly, but he never allowed 
you know, the misapplication of justice to, to tear away who he was as a human being. And what was remarkable to me was that he would talk about how sometimes it was the most subtle things about the everyday life outside of jail that he really, really struggled with because he would talk about how going to malls or going to crowded places, for example, he struggled with that a bit because he just felt a bit of vertigo in those moments. And even he said that the time that he was in solitary confinement on death row, he was used to living in like a sleeping in a very small cot. So he said that literally when he got his own place, um, he, he felt uncomfortable in his own bed. He had like a full size bed or queen size bed. And he said that I just felt uncomfortable because my, for 30 years, I contorted my body into sleeping into that small, a small cot. And now with the bigger bed, I'm, I'm not used to stretching out. And I used, so my whole, my muscle memory is a bit off. So I think it, it interview really, and I would love to kind of speak more about it and write about it as well, just about the kind of psychological impacts of our prison system. And, and really these are forms of state sanctioned torture. Um, that that are happening. And I think that it's it's not, you know, oftentimes in the media, it's not covered as such. And I think that when people are, you know, incarcerated in many ways, they're seen as kind of like they're they're incapacitated, they're away from all of us, and they're not and they don't have to you don't have to worry about them anymore, really. But I think that we're seeing now with just the way that COVID and the pandemic is hitting people who are incarcerated, thinking about climate change and about how that affects incarcerated people and also the exploitation of incarcerated folks' labor too across the United States, especially in the US South. I think that, you know, Mr. Hinton's story is important. And I'm glad that Brian Stevenson included him in the story of Just Mercy film. And I hope that more people just learn about his life and about what he's doing now because he's a remarkable human being. Oh, well, it was nice to meet you, Justin. I never met you before. But yeah, nice to meet you too. Omar. Well, we didn't overlap, but it's good to meet yeah, you as well. Yeah, it's it's nice to see someone from SPAVMA alumni being a professor. I want to be a professor, you know, after my interview with like Ms. Sukara and going on MFP trip, I actually like changed my career track. I actually want to get a PhD and be a professor one day. Oh, so, nice, nice, yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I say, you know, my work with Dr. Ortiz and, and, you know, at UF in the oral history program, you know, I wouldn't have the job that I have now without that. So I think I, I owe a great debt to SPAP and that's why I always come back whenever, you know, I can because I, I really appreciate you know, the mentorship that I got from Dr. Ortiz and also just about the mentorship I got from Ms. Sheila and everybody that I got to meet there. Hey, Ms. Sheila. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, so it, it was great. I think so the overriding message is we love SPOP and we really appreciate y'all. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thank, thank, thank you both uh, for the wonderful testimony and I just wanted to share uh, both Justin and Omar were, were talking about the Montgomery effect. Now, earlier we talked about stopping in Tallahassee to learn from Florida civil rights movement activists because we want to remember that the Sun Sunshine State has had a tremendous freedom movement over the, the generations. Uh, but on the way to the Delta, we also has, uh, traditionally stop in Montgomery, Alabama. And there's this amazing museum some of you on the call may have heard about or have seen, the Equal Justice Initiative. And Justin mentioned Brian Stevenson and being able to interview Ray Allen Hinton uh, when he was just literally just a few weeks off of 30 years of death row. But now EJI, of course, has built that incredible lynching, uh, uh, anti-lynching museum, the monument, the memorial to lynching victims. So on our way to the Delta, we spent an, at least a half day there just reflecting, uh, walking around, talking to each other. It's very intense. There's a lot of tears. There's a lot of anger. And so uh, each night of the trip, and usually the trip lasts about a week or a week and a half, we have kind of breakout sessions, you know, talk back sessions, rap sessions. We're always talking to each other, right? Uh, the, the trip from Gainesville to the Delta usually takes about 12 hours. But when we stop in places like Montgomery, uh, to talk to people from the Equal Justice Initiative, a new kind of education really begins. And as a classroom teacher, um, I love lecturing. I love assigning, uh, as my students, current and former students can tell you, I love assigning readings, right? Uh, maybe, maybe too many readings sometimes, but being able to, to connect the classroom to the field, to, to, to field work, uh, the way I was taught by great professors like people like Peter Wood, uh, Bill Chave, Charles Payne, Larry Goodwin, being able to connect the, the classroom to, the, to field work and getting out in the open and in the world is really, really very important. 
Um, I told you that I'm going to continue to thank people as we go on tonight. So I want to thank someone who everyone will, uh, will uh, right away understand how important this thanks is. The video testimony you see tonight, the footage, the still photography, the, the moving images, 99% uh, of that was shot or directed by none other than Deborah Hendricks. Uh, Deborah Hendricks is the longest running staff member at the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. We are tremendously blessed to have Deborah with us. Uh, she spent a lot of time putting, producing this program. And as you all know, she spends a lot of time every summer making sure we have fresh batteries in our recorders. So like, what happens if you're in the middle of Delta and you run out of power? Well, Deborah Hendricks can solve that problem for you. And so I just want to thank from the bottom of my heart, Deborah Hendricks. Um, for making it all possible. I also want to thank some other incredible educators on the line tonight. I noticed Tony Lee Maitland is with us. Welcome back, Tony Lee. Professor Sharon Austin, my colleague from African American Studies, um, tremendous writer about Mississippi, uh, Black politics. Sharon has been a person who has referred so many great students to the Mississippi Freedom Project trip, including Grant Palmer, and also Betty Stewart Fullwood. Uh, my dear colleague of many years, who's really um, has been there for our students for, for decades. Um, so our next, as we turn to our next segments, we're going to continue to really emphasize the theme of academics working in communities and how we bridge the town and gown divide and how we do that across states, across timelines, um, if you will. Um, we're going to share some more trips from, um, or some more video clips from uh, UF alums who, who kind of reflect on their, uh, how the Mississippi Freedom Project uh, impacted their lives. So I'm Matthew Simmons. I just wanted to share a couple of thoughts about my uh, Mississippi Freedom Trip uh, experience. Um, overall, it was pretty incredible um, getting to engage and interact with folks who had participated um, in some aspect of the civil rights movement, right? So um, understanding their lived experiences, um, listening to their stories, uh, one individual in particular who stands out was a woman who was disowned by her family um, because she um, had friendships with Black people. And in fact, they sent her away um, to school for juvenile delinquents because of this. Um, and so it was really interesting hearing that experience. Uh, you know, another gentleman, um, you know, talked about his experience um, with the B.B. King Museum and, uh, you know, mentoring um, youth when he was a small business owner. And so just really interesting um, hearing about different stories um, from different communities. And more importantly than that, seeing undergraduates um, get excited about doing history, right? So I went as a PhD student, but there were a lot of undergraduates on the trip and seeing them kind of grow intellectually and again, get excited uh, by the process of doing history and for many of them, um, you know, connecting uh, with folks who had been active in earlier, you know, social movements and civil rights movement, I think spurred on their own interest in getting involved in contemporary social movements. So overall, a pretty incredible experience. Whenever you, you know, put a number of people in close quarters in vans, uh, it makes for really interesting conversations. But again, this is the kind of work that you know, every college student, undergraduate or graduate should really be able to do um, and should have access to do because it puts um, a lot of the things learned in the classroom into practice. And it, it allows for an opportunity again to you know, talk to real people about their experiences, um, you know, fighting segregation, fighting racism, and certainly, you know, the memories from this trip are something that I will continue to appreciate uh, for the rest of my life. And they've certainly impacted me as an oral historian. Thank you.
Hi everyone, my name is Allison Mitchell and I went on the Mississippi Delta trip in the summer of 2017. And I think I speak for a lot of people when I say that this is more than just a history research trip. Um, for me personally, I think it really helped me understand um, my role as a historian. It helped me understand the role of history as a as it, you know pertains to personal experiences and emotional connections and community engagement and development and fostering, you know, connections to people who may live, you know, tons of states away from you. Um, it helped me understand the importance of Black history, Southern history, civil rights history, um, and just being able to take the time, um, well, being thankful that they took the time to talk to us, to sit down with us, to share those personal moments and experiences with us. Um, it's something I'll always cherish and be extremely grateful for. Um, I never realized how, you know, connected I was to the past until I sat down and listened to a former civil rights leader talk about what they did and how they, you know, navigated that space um, and how they continue to navigate it now in older age. You know, it wasn't until I saw, you know, younger people who we engage with who are around our age who are continuing the legacy of maintaining their the history of the people who came before them. Um, that's something that you can't get in a classroom. That's something you can't get in a book. You know, it's something you have to experience. And I'm so grateful for that because I think a lot of us thought we were going there to do something, but quite frankly, they've done so much for us. And, you know, I'm very thankful for the, the experience I had, um, the people I went with, you guys were awesome. And, you know, even over the long car trip, it was still, you know, definitely worth it in so many ways. And I'm just, you know, excited to see what this trip um, is going to look like in the future. Um, and just all the other endeavors that SPOP's going to continue to, you know, be a part of. Um, so yeah, just, it was a great experience. Thank you, Allison and Matt. And Matt, of course, teaches at the University of South Florida. Uh, Allison Mitchell is currently a history PhD candidate at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, I also want to acknowledge the incredible work of our former associate director at the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program, uh, Dr. Ryan Marini. Uh, Ryan was responsible for many years uh, for teaching and mentoring our students, giving them oral history training uh, before we even got in the van, got in the vans, so that our students would be able to do outstanding oral history work um, in the Delta. So thank you, Dr. Marini. It's great to see you back uh, for this this Proctor Program uh, reunion. Um, I also wanted to, to pause for a moment to thank our community contacts. You've heard the word community quite a bit tonight. Uh, the oral history program at UF emphasizes a community-based approach to oral history that I learned both as a labor organizer, but when I was in graduate school, you know, watching people like um, Dr. Jacqueline Hall at UNC Chapel Hill uh, watching people like Dr. Samuel Proctor at, at UF Oral History. And the community-based oral history theory basically says that, again, we don't go into a community unless they invite us. And then we talk about what is it that we can do for communities? And not just like in the, in the charity mode, but, but is there a research project? Is there a museum that's being built? Um, is there um, a, a school that wants oral history training? Um, in other words, we learn kind of the basic rudiments of civic engagement, um, how to bridge those town and gown divides. Um, I want to mention also another stop that's become traditional on our way to the Mississippi Delta is we often stop in a Jefferson County, uh, Florida, a panhandle county full of history. And one of our dear guides there, Mr. John Nelson, a Vietnam veteran of the American War in Vietnam, um, a man who actually integrated uh, many American Legion posts uh, in the state of Florida, which were segregated uh, up until less than two decades ago. So Mr. Nelson takes us and we, we've interviewed uh, uh, Tuskegee Airmen, uh, Montford Point Marines, um, African American World War II veterans, Korean War veterans. So thank you, Mr. Nelson for, for, for allowing us to be able to be part of that history. In Sunflower County, Mississippi, I see a few people on the line, uh, Arlene Sanders, uh, who taught and just retired from Delta State University, uh, who hosted us in, at Delta State for many years. Uh, Stacy White, 
the daughter of Dorsey uh, White, who I first interviewed in the summer of 1995. And when we, one of our first projects was to put together, uh, and it, it was years in the making, a 50th anniversary uh, reunion booklet for veterans of Mississippi Freedom Summer in Indianola, Mississippi. And this we did under the direction of the Sunflower County Civil Rights Organization and Stacy White. And our students were able to present that 50th anniversary reunion booklet to the veterans of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh, people, legendary people like Lawrence Guillot, uh, like Hollis Watkins, like Charles McLaurin. It was just an incredible uh, year for that 50th anniversary of Mississippi Freedom Summer that our students were able to participate in. Um, Natchez, Mississippi. I want to thank Pierce Butler, my colleague in Veterans for Peace, who initially made us, gave us the introduction to Natchez, Mississippi. Now, those of you familiar with Natchez geography know Natchez is a little out of the Delta. It's a little to the South, but it has full of history nonetheless. Once we got to Natchez, people like Sarah Boxley, Kathy Moody, Daryl White, Jeremy Houston made us feel welcome and helped us understand what makes that region of southeastern Mississippi and into Louisiana so unique. Uh, Mr. Boxley took us to deep into Louisiana to interview founders of the Deacons for, for Self-Defense and Justice. Uh, so we're just so grateful for them. Uh, I want to turn now to our final live panel for this evening. Um, it, it's with tremendous pleasure that I welcome back two of our more recent uh, UF graduates. Uh, Sam and Charity. And uh, every time I see them, I think, wow, we're about to get some great education here. Um, uh, they were leaders at the Proctor Oral History Program for many years. Uh, they're doing incredible work now with their lives. And I'm going to turn the floor over, over to, to the both of you. Thank you so much for being here this evening. Oh, sorry. Oh. Hi, great to see everyone. Um, especially the, the 2017 alum from the Mississippi trip, you know, hey, shout out to, you know, Omar, um, Allison, and also Tony. <laughs> um, so um, my, my experience with the trip was, it was always, I guess, reflection um, from the first day that, you know, we started in Tallahassee all the way up until the last day. Um, it was just always something at the end of the day that we needed to reflect upon. I think my most, I guess, memorable part of the trip was when we were in Natchez um, and we got to talk to one family in particular um, and we got to learn about the Black Dot Gang. Um, that, was, that was like my most, I guess, memorable part of the trip. Um, I've used my experiences as a teacher um, it, you know, kind of educate my students. And it's also like evolved me as a teacher as well. Um, it's made me more, how can I put it? Um, I guess able to be more relatable to them because you get to see all the different walks of life, I guess, from um, Mississippi. So that, that was like my experience. I don't know if Christina wants to, or I'm sorry, Samantha wants to add on to it. Yeah, yeah. Also, I, I love seeing everybody on here. Hi, it's been so long. Uh, it's so great to reconnect. Um, I'm just so thankful to be here. And uh, I cannot emphasize enough, you know, the title of this panel is Experiences to Last a Lifetime. And I can't tell you how much this trip has changed my life. Uh, I'm currently a first year student in law school right now. And this trip completely redirected the way that I take on that work and uh, the way that I truly believe that, you know, being a lawyer requires you to be a movement lawyer. It requires you to engage with your community, to build with your community uh, and to just see the humanness in your community. And um, I think I truly, truly learned that from this trip. Uh, and I first attended the trip in 2018. And uh, I was I was a participant. It, it fell into my lap. It was just 
fate that that happened. And uh, I learned so much. I met the most incredible people. I, I was welcomed into these spaces of vulnerability. Uh, and you really, you really just felt the truth uh, of these storytellers who, you know, don't get heard often. And so that was just so powerful. And then I had the honor of co-leading the trip in 2019. Uh, and I'm so glad Omar mentioned uh, Sweet Willie Wine because that was also probably my favorite interview of that trip. Uh, and at, towards the end of the interview, he said, you know, to all of us, he said, you know, this, this freedom work, this is a lifetime job. Are, are you all prepared for that? Are you ready for that? Uh, and I think we all looked at each other and we're like, hell yeah, we are. <laughs> yeah, we're ready for that. Um, so just, just incredible experiences. Uh, and Cherry, if you want to say anything else, please. But uh, just, I can't emphasize how much this trip has changed my life. Yeah, I mean, it, it really has. And also, I guess the memories that I've made with people and connections, um, not only, I guess, with the community, because it was a really good bridge from there, but even with students that came on the trip with us. Um, I mean, those are connections that I guess have been like there for a lifetime. Um, so I, I've been appreciative of it. Um, I learned about the trip actually from another history professor. Uh, when I was at Santa Fe and she told me about it. So I was excited to go. Yeah, and just also emphasizing how, you know, like this, this trip led me to so many other spaces. Like when I like came on, like the dream defenders, like this trip radicalized me. This trip really taught me a history that growing up throughout my whole life in the US, uh, you don't learn it at all. Uh, and so it was just very eye-opening and uh, yeah, that's just what I wanted to add. Well, thank you both. I wonder if you wouldn't mind telling us um, kind of what you're doing now, Charity. We were talking a bit earlier before the program started. Okay, um, right now I teach at a prison, um, New River Correctional Institution. I am an academic teacher. Um, well, I've used or incorporated oral history into a lot of my lesson plans. Um, I teach mainly GED classes, so allowing me to use those um, oral history um, snippets and incorporating it into education um, in, I guess, an alternative space has been pretty interesting and cool. Um, the, teacher, or the teachers and not only uh, the students are always appreciative of it. Uh, and yeah, right now I said I'm a first year law student. I'm at Georgetown Law right now. So I'm, on, I'm in DC actually, very interesting place to be right now. Um, but uh, this first summer, I'm probably going to be doing uh, public defense or prisoners uh, rights. So uh, that's really the work that I hope to be doing. And then later on, um, movement work. That, that's why I came to law school in the first place. And so um, I think that's really grounded in what I learned on this trip, which is, you know, our collective liberation is rooted in Black liberation. And that's rooted in the civil rights struggle and rooted in the stories that we've been taught and um, had the opportunity to listen to. All right, well, thank you to both of you. It's so great to see you. Um, you know, as we transition into our next part of the program, one of the things that we've done in recent years is invite back uh, alumni. Now, when we can get the actual field work going again, uh, when we kind of transition out of the global pandemic, uh, we'll definitely be inviting both of you to come back um, at some point and, and talk with, uh, you know, your, your peers uh, in, in the future. So just, I wanna thank both of you for just giving wonderful testimony and uh, just being here. And you can see by the, the responses in the chat bar that people are so excited to, to, see, to see you and to see everyone. Um, before I turn to the next part, I want to talk about resources uh, and, and money because everything you've been seeing today um, cost money, right? Batteries cost money, recording equipment. Um, the goal of the Mississippi Freedom Project trip is really to make the trip as uh, free as possible for our students. And so we pay for lodging, we pay for transportation. Uh, we even try to cover, you know, two or three meals. Um, we really try to make this trip egalitarian uh, and open in terms of uh, being open to, to all students, right? 
Um, and so I really want to thank so much um, our first um, and really most important funder to get the program started. Uh, even before I arrived at the University of Florida, um, when I was still a professor at the University of California in Santa Cruz, uh, I got a call one day from this young uh, Office of Advancement uh, officer at the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at UF. His name was Cody Helmer. And Cody said, Professor Ortiz, um, can you pitch an idea that might interest a donor? And so I actually pitched this trip, the Mississippi Freedom Project trip. Um, I didn't create it out of thin air because again, as I mentioned earlier, I've been talking to Stacy White at Mississippi Valley State University about bringing a group of students to Mississippi who could help put together an oral history project um, that could commemorate Freedom Summer, right? So that was kind of the genesis. But anyway, I pitched this idea to Cody uh, Helmer and he said, well, give me a week. A week later, he called me and he said this gentleman by the name of Bill DeGrove had pledged $10,000 per year to support the trip. So that got us started. That was our seed money that made it possible to start the trip. Uh, later, other incredible individuals stepped up. Uh, I wanna mention my dear colleagues, Bob and Gay Zeger, uh, who both passed away a few years ago. Uh, Bob was a professor of history at UF. Gay was a professor at Santa Fe College. They were incredible supporters of the trip. Um, and then the intergenerational theme, uh, it's passed down. So their son, uh, Roberto Zier Jr. and his family now have provided critical financial support for our trip. Both sons of Samuel Proctor, the founder of the Samuel Proctor Oil History Program, Mark Proctor and Alan Proctor have not only provided resources, but Mark Proctor has taken us out to lunch uh, almost every year on our way back from the Delta. You, you've heard from a lot of current or future attorneys in this, this call tonight. So Mark Proctor um, is a senior partner at Levin and Papantonio. And of course, as, as many of us know, Fred Levin just passed away uh, just a couple weeks ago from COVID-19. And Mark Proctor would take us out to lunch in Pensacola, kind of our halfway trip, uh, halfway on the trip back from the Delta, right? And, um, and gives us, just gives a great pep talk to all the pre-law students. Why do you wanna go into law? Why do you wanna become an attorney? And he helps our pre-law students understand the moral commitment to social justice that has driven him uh, and has really defined his career. So I'm really grateful for all of those individuals for supporting us. So we're going to see now our last kind of round of, um, of testimonies, a video testimonial we, uh, from Derek Gomez, from also our Alachua uh, County Poet Laureate, Stan Richardson, and a testimonial from our community guide and organizer in Elaine, Arkansas, Mary Olson. Participating in the Mississippi Freedom Project trip with the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program was the single most formative part of my college experience. I would dare to say that most of those lucky enough to get into a white van outside of Pew Hall early on a summer morning and make the trip out to Mississippi would say the same. The trip changes you. It forces you to reckon with the brittleness of the official narrative about the civil rights movement. The real legacy is more painful and still unfinished, but also you get a sense of the incredible bravery and resolve of the organizers and educators and activists and community members that were willing to confront an unjust system. It's an honor that these communities, especially the elders, would welcome us into their homes. They would sit down with us and allow their memories to be recorded, even the most painful ones. All of this would have been impossible without Margaret Block. I hope she's smiling up in heaven, knowing that we're still talking about her after so many years. What a force of nature she was with her dry humor and willingness to tell you exactly how she felt about you. One of my favorite moments was sitting in a pizza restaurant in some back road Mississippi town with Miss Margaret reciting her fiery truth-telling poetry without a care in the world who heard. 
that's still a moment that inspires me, to be honest, and to always honor the legacy of those that fought to make this country a little bit more just. And I'm really happy to have been part of this trip, and I'm really happy to have been asked to give a couple of my thoughts, and I hope that this is a good program. Hello, I am E. Stanley Richardson, Poet Laureate, Alachua County, Florida. Back in 2018, I had the wonderful opportunity to travel with the University of Florida Samuel Proctor Oral History Program on their annual Mississippi Freedom Project. I can best describe it as an intergenerational educational excursion through the heart of the South. We left Gainesville, traveled to Tallahassee, Florida, on to Montgomery, Alabama, and throughout the Mississippi Delta. I thoroughly enjoyed uh, sharing in the enthusiasm and the excitement of the young students as they absorbed all of that rich history. But I think what I cherished most about that trip was being in the company of a veteran an elder of the civil rights movement, as she retraced some of her footsteps when she was a student at Spelman at the height of the civil rights movement, participating in marches and, and freedom rides and sit-ins, Dr. Gwendolyn Zahara Simmons, whose conversation and wise reflection during that trip I will cherish forever. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paul Latisse for your brilliant instruction. Thank you to your staff and everyone at the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. Continue success. God bless. The Elaine Legacy Center's mission is to research, preserve, and share the oral histories of descendants still living in the area of the killing fields of 1919. Building on the foundation of faith, values, and determination of our forebears, we are building our village as a center of Delta spirituality, culture, art, music, and education so that pilgrims and tourists will find meaning here. We appreciate Dr. Paul Ortiz and University of Florida students and staff who came with him and eagerly await their post-COVID return. They listened to our stories, recorded them, and then made them available to us. One recording is on our website, which is elainelegacycenter.org, and others are used as needed. Unlike so many others who come to Elaine, Dr. Ortiz was sure everyone understood. You do not try to change our stories to fit what you say happened in Elaine. Unlike many others who come to Elaine, you do not try to make money for yourself from our stories and leave. Instead, you come with academic integrity, a respect for all of us, no matter how poor we are, and you leave us with a little more pride and hope for our future. Written by Dr. Mary Olson, Elaine Legacy Center, Elaine, Arkansas. When I was in graduate school at Duke University, way back in the 1990s, if you would have told me that I would have been in Elaine, Arkansas around the 100th, 100th anniversary of the Elaine Massacre, uh, I would have said, what? Uh, this was an event that was in the history books. It's one of the worst, most horrific anti-Black massacres in the history of this entire hemisphere. It involved federal troops attacking black communities, black farmers. It involved white developers and realtors stealing that land and expropriating it after federal troops gunned down entire black neighborhoods. So one day I got a call from Dr. Mary Olson and she said, Professor Ortiz, we've been watching your program uh, from afar. We'd like you to come and help us document and commemorate the Elaine massacre. Uh, and, you know, I, I was just, I literally was in tears. Uh, I couldn't believe this incredible opportunity 
And I just want to say that the students on that trip uh, made me so proud and, and were incredible field workers. The stories that were shared with us um, were, were sometimes painful stories, but they were triumphant stories from the Arkansas Delta. The idea that this tragedy had occurred, that the federal and state authorities had inflicted it upon Black Arkan uh, Arkansans, but the fact that African-Americans in Elaine and their allies had turned this story around and said, we're the we were the, among the founders of the modern civil rights movement. We turn this tragedy into a story of human rights struggles, into a story of let's talk about reparations now. So I just want to thank Mary Olson for inviting us in, and we will be back um, to Elaine as, as soon as we can. I also want, as we close tonight, and remember we are going to have a QA. Uh, we've uh, asked our panelists, uh, some of whom can stick around to answer questions. Uh, we'll have in the chat bar. Um, but I also wanted to do some more thanks. Um, everything you see tonight um, had to be arranged. Uh, tickets had to be purchased to museum trips. Uh, uh, hotel rooms had to be reserved. Vans had to be reserved. Vans had to be filled with gas. Phones had, phone calls had to be answered. Uh, interviews had to be scheduled. So the person who's at the center of all that is none other, none other than my dear colleague, Ms. Tamara Jenkins. Tamar Jenkins has been the office manager at the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program now for about a decade or more. And Tamara, as any of the current and former students can tell you, is the nerve center um, of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. We couldn't do it without her. So thank you, Tamara, so much. Um, I also want to acknowledge another dear colleague on the line tonight. Uh, Dr. Churchill Roberts, who is my colleague in the College of Journalism and Communications here at the University of Florida. Um, I mentioned Churchill because now a basic part of the training that our students do here before they go to the Mississippi Delta is to watch a remarkable documentary. Uh, now, Churchill Roberts has been a professor for many years, but before that, he was a student, right, like all of us. And when he was a student, he created the first documentary about the 1968 Memphis sanitation workers strike. That documentary is called Keep Your Trash. And we were so honored here at the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program several years ago uh, when Churchill Roberts approached Deborah Hendricks and Deborah was able to digitize that film Keep Your Trash on Dr. King's Final Crusade. So it's part of it's become part of our training for the trip. Um, I want to make sure that I've thanked everyone. There's so many people to thank. I apologize for missing people. Um, Sheila Payne is really going to not like this, but almost every single former SPOP student has asked me, please thank Ms. Sheila Payne for the work she's done in sustaining the Mississippi Freedom Project. So thank you, Sheila. Um, and so right now um, we can open it to, to questions as folks are um, thinking of questions. Again, I wanna thank you for joining us this evening for UF and the Mississippi Delta. Um, I wanna thank the, my dear colleagues at the, at the Office of Advancement at the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Um, I also wanna take a few moments or we're thinking of, of possible questions to thank some of our academic sponsors. So the Proctor Program has really been blessed over the years. Uh, we've been sponsored by a number of units on campus, including African-American studies, the Bob Graham Center for Public Service, the Center for Gender, Sexualities, and Women's Studies, and George A. Smathers Libraries. Uh, I wanna thank in particular Sharon Austin, David Colburn, Matt Jacobs, Bonnie Marotti, of course, chairs of those respective programs. Um, I also wanna thank Dean Judy Russell at George Smathers Libraries. Uh, she has been a stalwart supporter of the program from the very beginning. So as you, as you kind of uh, have gotten the theme over the evening, the Mississippi Freedom Project is a week long field trip, oral history field work trip in the Mississippi Delta. Um, it involves taking 12 to 15 students to the Delta per summer, but it relies on, it rests upon the foundation of really the work of hundreds and ultimately thousands of people. So. Again, I wanna thank everyone for attending tonight. I wanna to thank all of our community supporters and sustainers. We will be back in the field 
Uh, we're planning to do a virtual reunion. Um, this summer, we've already started talking about that. And to use that virtual reunion for all the sites that we work with to plan our next steps when we can actually begin oil history field work again. Um, so any questions that we have, and um, Deborah, I don't know how we wanted to facilitate this. I could read the questions for the, our panelists. Um, we're getting a lot of a lot of strong memories still, so I don't know if folks just wanted to hang out. Um, we are close to 8 p.m., but if you, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to put the. Um, let me adjust my camera here for a minute. The uh, URL for the Samuel Proctor Oil History Program, and if you want to learn more about us, check us out. Uh, give us a call, drop us an email, and I'm just putting the the the, um, the URL for the Oil History Program. We're open 24-7. Um, we, our most famous field trip, of course, is the Mississippi Delta trip, but we've also traveled to Immokalee, Florida. We've also traveled several times to Pensacola. Uh, there's a very rich African-American history in Western Florida. We have traveled to the Virginia Tidewater, uh, multiple times. Um, we have went out to Tucson, Arizona to document Mexican-American studies there. Um, we're also open to new types of field work experiences. Um, if you're living in a community that, that wants uh, and can, can benefit uh, from working with the oil history program, uh, please let us know. Uh, closer to home, we've been working for years with the community of Ocoee, Florida which just commemorated as well uh, the 100th anniversary of the Ocoee Election Day Massacre. And we've been working with people in Ocoee on that. Uh, we've also been working very close to home uh, with people in Newberry, Florida, uh, commemorating the history of the Newberry Six uh, anti-Black lynching. And uh, in fact, on February 5th, we will be going out to participate in the soil sample ceremony. Uh, Justin Hosby and others uh, mentioned to um, earlier about the work we've done with the Equal Justice Initiative or EJI. Uh, Brian Stevenson, of course, is, is famously known for being the co-founder of EJI. So we do work locally with African-American communities. I saw Ms. Vivian Filer uh, on the, the line earlier. Thank you, uh, Ms. Filer, for being a guide and uh, uh, an elder and a teacher to so many of our students who are interested in becoming more active in local communities. And so I think I saw, um, Heather, you can send me uh, questions as soon as, as soon as you're ready. Um, I think we are getting some questions in the, in the queue. So here's a question and, and Deborah um, and Stephanie, I don't know how we wanted to facilitate. Um, I'll go ahead and read the question. Um, I see Marna and Omar and Naila, Justin, um, uh, Charity is still on the line. So I'll go ahead and read the question and anyone can answer it if they, if they want to as we transition. Um, so we'll just have time for, for a, a few questions here um, as we kind of wrap up. Um, this is from Anonymous. Um, I grew up with a lot of family in the Delta and I feel that a lot of times Mississippi is the butt of a joke. How do you feel about people? How do you feel about how people ignore the rich culture and history of the area? Um, I definitely think that your work helps greatly. So thank you. So anyone can can address that. Well, uh, if I can add for a second, um, and Paul, thanks again for putting this together, and Deborah and Tamara, all that you do. I don't think Mississippi is a joke. I was drawn there. I mean, the natural beauty uh, was incredible. And to see you know, that people lived in this place because of what they thought was valuable about the land and the connections people. When we stood in Fannie Lou Hamer's you know, park and we watched in the beginning how it, how it grew over the years, you know, Margaret sang there that first time we were together. Then every year we came back, something, something different was done. We went to places like Drew, Mississippi or Sunflower, Mississippi. You know, yes, there were signs that more could be done, but 
also the, the just the historic elements. I mean, we were put inside one of those jail cells in Drew, Mississippi, and it wasn't as big as a little area I'm sitting in right now. So I think that the natural beauty of Mississippi always spoke to me, you know, driving there as I did a couple of times solo. And also with our trip, I was always captivated by the natural beauty. And I also thought that it was, um, you know, there was a like a cognitive distance because you asked yourself, how could these horrible things have happened um, you know, in, in this beautiful place. We went to Sumner County to the, the courthouse. And I remember being in that room thinking, oh my gosh, this is as big as this is. Cause you'd seen all the, the, the recordings over time. I, I think that the idea that someone might have to suggest that Mississippi is a joke is, a, is it's an insufficient argument. I think there's much mystery, much to love. You're going to several of those, um, you know, graveyards of the great blues master who knows which one was was supposed to be the real robert johnson graveyard and i'm not trying to push music as the main thing because i think there was too much of a focus for a while on you know kind of blues trails and stuff like that but actually getting to meet people and being there um mississippi still it haunts me and intrigues me I, I can't wait to go back again it's 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 definitely no joke that's not a fair statement to make Um, I would like to add to what Mr. Weston said. To me, it was like the best place ever. Like everyone treated us like family. Um, we were always welcomed in. Um, I mean, <laughs> yeah, they were, they were really, really welcoming of us. Um, I feel like anywhere we went, we were treated like family. So that was like a, a really, I guess, uh, danger for me. Um, because, you know, just meeting everyone for like the first time and then, you know, them being so welcoming of us and wanting to tell their story. Um, yeah, I mean, and then also shout out to every place that we ate. I'm not even gonna lie. That was like the best part of the trip. Um, we had so much um, food to it wasn't even funny anymore. So that was, that, to me, that made the trip. It really did. The stories were awesome, but the food was amazing. So that was my my little tidbit. I think real quick, just you know, the stories that get told about black people, the stories that get told about poor people. Um, you know, Florida gets is a Florida man, and it, you know what I mean. Like we're we're no strangers to that. But those are stories that get told about, that you know, passed down about poor people and and and, and black folks. So just you know, it means you shook something up, means somebody got scared <laughs> of like the potential of the thing. Um, so don't let it, don't let it make you embarrassed. Yeah, I mean, I think of Florida, uh, uh, I think of Mississippi is really the heartland of the civil rights movement. And it, it's, it's the spark plug. But going back to the early slave revolts, uh, uh, the, the highest per capita number of of African-American former slaves who served in the Union Army came from Mississippi. Uh, the first African-American US Senator came from Mississippi. Um, if you think of Congressman John Lewis who just passed away, I mean, Mississippi was his proving ground. Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, you think of this, the Mississippi Freedom Summer, Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. But again, because we're, we're, we're not told our history, we forget so quickly or we didn't even know. So this is why I think Mississippi is so very important. Um, the next question, and we'll kind of wrap it up. We'll, I think we have time for just one more question, uh, but, but, but this, is, this is a good one. This requires some geographical memory here. Um, would you ever consider going in the route through Pensacola, Mobile, and Jackson? I think that route has also some amazing civil rights history. So Pensacola, Mobile, and Jackson. I personally drove the uh, Pensacola to Hattiesburg and then up to Jackson route. And, uh, you know, I went, I stopped in Laurel, Mississippi, and I'd never heard of Laurel, Mississippi. And now it's become really popular on television because of that uh, HGTV show, Hometown, where the people have made, um, a husband and wife couple have added to the texture of the community and they're moving to other communities by taking old historic homes and changing them. But the Laurel, Mississippi I knew about came because I went to St. Paul's uh, Church, which was there, which is one of the last public presentations that Dr. Martin Luther King gave before he died. And also the, um, the reaction to, to integration and SNCC and the activities in Mississippi were so significant um, that um, 
the SNCC workers agreed they negotiated with the Klan to leave because the bombing and the killings were so significant. They just said, look, we'll, we'll get out of here. So um, I think it will be very interesting to find uh, another route. Uh, Mobile is you know, certainly historic because of um, you know, the Fair Employment Practices Committee, you know, the, the people that worked on the ships, the, the, the fight, the struggle for even during the war, during World War II, to give uh, gainful employment to people of color. Mobile will be a central uh, part for that. Um, but I've taken a different route and enjoyed it. And everything is beautiful when you travel through that part of the world. I mean, Alabama, Mississippi, Northwest Florida. Um, I understand why uh, people fought over it over time, why people were uh, caught upon to fight against colonialization because that is a beautiful country all the way through. And there's just wonderful, uh, great natural scenes. Justin Hosby, I think you've made that drive through Mobile, right? Yeah, I, I was laughing when um, that question came up because I remember, I think on the leg back, I think me and um, Miss Deborah were in one van together. I think I drove the first leg at night from, I think, was it um, Cleveland down through Jackson, the nighttime the leg that night. So I remember just driving that and going through Jackson and so many potholes in Jackson. I woke everybody up driving because the pothole, we kept hitting them <laughs> as we hit through Jackson. But um. But yeah, I think my research is based in New Orleans. So I've done, you know, with SPOP as well, has helped me do work across the whole Delta region from, you know, Memphis on down to Louisiana. So of course, I think that such an important, um, interesting and diverse syncretic history of cultures and histories that are in the Gulf Coast region. So I think that, um, I think it would be amazing for, you know, some more attention to be placed on, you know, African-American and indigenous people who, you know, have kind of, you know, lived there and created that, that space for so long. As Martin said, it's so beautiful. And I think that's why even the question, about, the question about Mississippi, you know, people always ask me about the trip and I always say Mississippi was wonderful. It was beautiful. I loved it. And they're like, how could you love Mississippi? Why Mississippi? And, and I think it's a beautiful place. I think that there's lots of suppression that happens there of the beauty and the people. But like Naila said, it's about how people think about poor people and black people. That makes it kind of like you have poor black people, then you have white races. How would you want to be there? I think that's a that's a really bad binary to think about it because it's such a beautiful place, um, such wonderful history and the people there, you know, we've all remarked upon how beautiful we were treated by the people of Mississippi. It's an, it's an amazing place. I think the Gulf Coast is definitely a cool place to do some research and think about that. We had uh, several different people, uh, including um, our mentor and guide in Elaine. Uh, Dr. Mary Olson asked us, what is the Mississippi Freedom Project looking like for the year of 2021? And I think um, I can answer part of that. Uh, one is, uh, Mary, we are going to try to get together kind of a reunion um, and a retreat of our uh, current and former kind of uh, site, you know, the, the sites that we worked in, and really kind of come up with an action plan and maybe plan out, you know, five or eight years and think about where we want to go from here um, and what we can do you know, to help uh, and, and learn more from communities you know, like Elaine, uh, Akoe, maybe uh, Justin, you mentioned indigenous history. Uh, we also have been, have been going to the Porch Band of Creek Indian Nation um, and doing field work there. And we may want to think about kind of combining uh, those trips at some point. Um, the other one, a couple more questions. Uh, what are ways that uh, undergraduate students can get involved? So I'm going to put our the Proctor Oral History Program website. You can contact us anytime. Give us a call, drop us an email, and look at our site, the Mississippi Freedom Project, um, and we'd love to talk to you about that, about the project. And certainly any of the individuals you see tonight, I'm sure would love to talk to you about the project as well. Um, so the last, the last question, do you have a process for fact-checking interviews prior to publication? Is that an issue for you? Uh, I found some problems with my own work doing interviews and of course my work as a practicing lawyer. So I mentioned earlier in terms of, we do a lot of um, book work as well as the oral histories. We, we put the oral histories into books. Uh, the oral history uh, uh, programs um, collections have surpassed 9,000 oral history interviews. Um, with Native Americans, African Americans, I mean, people from uh, literally all walks of life. And we always encourage people to, to draw from as many sources as possible to make a historical argument. 
And in, with our Mississippi Freedom Project, um, with, the, with the Freedom Summer booklet, we did just that. We combined archival sources with the memories. Um, we have found that the memory work is really, really very important. So sometimes someone, you know, might say, well, you know, we had Mississippi Freedom uh, uh, Summer was in 1963. Well, we know it was in 64, and so we can easily make that correction. But what we want to hear is their memories, what it meant to them, you know, the subjective elements of their lives. Because historians are always complaining, right? Teachers are always complaining. Professors are always complaining. My, I can teach my students the dates, but they don't understand the meaning. What did this mean to people? What did it mean to be? What did it mean to work with Fannie Lou Hamer? And that's what we're trying to get at. And so we as historians can, again, we can fill in the dates and times, and things like that, but we have a hard time getting to the meaning without the oral history. So that's kind of how I uh, um, answer that question. Any, any of my colleagues on the, the panel um, can answer as we begin to, to, to wrap up this evening. Yeah, Paul, I'd love to speak to that question because the, the interview really belongs to the person being interviewed. We're being honored to get a chance to, to come in and make those reflections from them. And I remember interviewing Patricia Stevens Duke in her home, the late Dr. Duke. And uh, I'd gone there, it was, it was, you know, just one of those days where things just weren't working right for me. I didn't have my a recorder working. She sent me back to the, uh, to the Walmart in town to, to get a recorder, hit me on my head, boy, you know, you come over here to do this interview and you don't have your stuff together. But when we sat down, I asked her questions. And the first thing she did is she asked me a question back. I said, can you tell me what it was like in the movement? She said, well, I want to ask you a question. When you say what it was like back in the day in the movement, what is it that, that you mean? So she asked me a question back. And she was like that. She literally believed that historians spent too much time trying to construct and re remake events based upon the, uh, the framing that they were bringing into the situation. When you went into her home, you know, you would sign in. She had all these historic documents. She was very particular about what happened on particular dates and times and what she was doing there, which is why, you know, going to the Freedom House would be just such an, an incredible historic opportunity for anybody looking to, to start something, you know, to, to go there and find those original documents. But she also was very strongly connected to that idea that the people tell their own story in their own way and keep their own you know, evidence of it. That somebody else trying to dictate and say what the story is, is not, it's not, it's not, it doesn't get it. They don't, they don't get what we do. And one of the things that we do is that we just were honored to go out and learn from people the way they want to teach us, what they, what they want to share with us, what they feel comfortable sharing with us, not what we want to come and talk about. Anyone else want to take a meander at the at the meaning question, or should we kind of move to closing out? Well, we are storytellers, and so we were supposed to end the program a bit earlier this evening, um, but as you can tell, we've gone just a little over time, not too much really. Um, and it's certainly not as much time as that 15 hour van ride, which Sheila reminded us coming back from, uh, from Indianola, literally from Indianola to Gainesville is, is about 15 hours. Uh, and we don't even count the time difference, right? Um, uh, so I also wanted to mention a number of us talked about the importance of, of education tonight. Um, the Gainesville Veterans for Peace has a college scholarship program. Um, those of you interested who live in Alachua County, who have, uh, who know of folks, have parents, uh, students from Alachua County that uh, uh, would be interested in possibly financial support, uh, it's a $1,000 scholarship. Um, it can be applied towards uh, community college, University of Florida, colleges outside of our district. It can also be applied for apprenticeships or vocational um, training as well. So I put in the, the uh, website for veteran, Gainesville Veterans for Peace. Um, just check that out and I can answer any questions you may have about that scholarship. But we're gonna go ahead and wrap up tonight. And I really just wanna thank um, all of the individuals who provided video testimonies. Um, I especially wanna thank uh, Naila Summers, Marta Weston, Charity Kelly, Omar Sanchez, uh, Justin Hosby, uh, Sam Crisanti uh, uh, for coming back. Uh, and just making you know uh, uh, me so happy 
uh, and honored and proud to see uh, how well all of you are doing and, and just you, you're shaking up the world and using those lessons as you as you mentioned, you know, many of them learned in the Mississippi Delta. Um, I want to again thank Deborah Hendricks so much, Deborah, for producing this program, for always being the woman behind the camera who we don't usually see, but we need to applaud as much as we can. Um, for the same reasons, I want to thank Tamara Jenkins, who kept us uh, on schedule, who is our timekeeper tonight, uh, telling us uh, to keep it moving, keep it interesting, but keep it moving, right? I um, also want to thank Heather Halleck, uh, one of our newest staff members at SPOMP, for fielding the questions and helping us keep the program going. Again, I just want to thank so much Steve, Stephanie, and Meredith from the class College of Advancement and Alumni. Thank you so much for really helping us visualize this program for broad audience. And, and finally, thank you so much to our the people who've sustained and supported the Mississippi Freedom Project for so many years, supporting the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. Um, some of you are first time um, uh, folks. Some of you are, excuse the phrase, repeat offenders. You have supported us in the past, you've come back. Um, and become part of the, the Proctor Program family. So please do look us up on the internet. Um, uh, if you uh, log into the Oil Street Program website, uh, there's a spot you can end up on our newsletter. We send out a monthly newsletter. Uh, we feature alumni, ongoing projects. So um, again, as we wrap up, thank you everyone for being here for th this program, UF and the Mississippi Delta. Um, travel safely if you're traveling, uh, hopefully not, but look out for each other. Um, and um, um, I think we'll stick around for just a, a few more minutes, but we wanna be uh, respectful of our managers this evening, uh, uh, right, Deborah, to make sure that we don't keep you all up all night. So again, thank you on behalf of the University of Florida, the Samuel Proctor Oil Street uh, Program and the College of Law Arts uh, and Sciences uh, and and we will we have recorded this program too that's the penultimate thing i'll say um if you log into the oral history program website uh, we have a very active uh, youtube channel and you'll be able to see this program eventually it usually takes us about a month to mix the program down and and it will be there for posterity's sake so thank you all for a wonderful evening um let's do this more often uh when we can get together uh, uh face to face let's do that and, and, and trade, trade more stories, okay? Thank you, everyone. Have a, have a, have a good evening. Good night. Hey, before you guys go, I need to get some, oh, Nyla, look at that, she just, she dipped. That was quick. <laughs> <laughs> she just pop, pop, I'm gone, I'm a ghost. <laughs> I wanted to invite um, anybody that wants to participate in my uh, civil rights class at Oak Hall, this is the, I've now expanded to three classes. It started in one class, did it for three years, now in the fourth year, um, have the introduction to civil rights, a lot of it based on what we did at the Proctor Center, then um, uh, civil rights, 1900 to 1971, and then 1971 to present. So I'm always looking for speakers, you know, people to come in, you know, with a video, talk about stuff. So uh, I'll put my, I'm sure you guys have my contact information, but I'll just put it in the chat. Let me know uh, what's up if you ever have an idea. I mean, it does. Last night I met with Sandra Parks, and you know we're we're uh, working on some stuff. So, uh, just let you guys know that the beat goes on. You know, the work continues. Like I know all of you are doing great things. The Saint Augustine connection. Oh my gosh! Yeah, Saint Augustine was awesome. Has anybody talked to uh, Queen Quet recently, or uh, any of the uh, Oklahoma Seminoles? No. I, don't think I, was so. I was on leave, so I didn't really get to meet them. Well, that's our peeps. We can't leave. And what about um, the folks, the folks down in Melbourne at uh, Macedonia? We actually did try to reach out, but Miss um, Anjanette, you know, she relocated. Uh huh. Right. Um, yes. Yes. But we need to actually get in touch with the pastor at the church. She and Anjanette, she actually asked me to be in her dissertation committee. Mm -hmm. um, she's it, going to school where Northwestern or Chicago and wow. um, so yeah but she transitioned from being the pastor that we work with when uh, Jennifer I saw Jennifer Taluzma on the call didn't get a chance to say hey but um, Jennifer and Raina Shipman remember tomorrow when we went down there and Marna to do that oyster workshop 
-hmm. And um, Jennifer and Raina gave that that great presentation. And so, um, yeah, and it's been amazing because we've opened up these new collaborations. You know, we've been in Broward County. Uh, we went to Miami Dade with the South Florida People of Color. Um, we've done, you know, Naila and I did a panel together actually in Fort Lauderdale last year um, and talked with some of the Dream Defenders in, in South Florida. And they were just there today giving testimony. I don't, I don't know if you noticed, but Naila mentioned in the chat that some of the members of Dream Defenders gave testimony against the, uh, the uh, pending anti-protest bill, right? Uh, because they believe that, hey, we should be making laws against protesting, you know? And so, um, but yeah, we just continue to widen our, our sphere of collaboration. But as Deborah and Tamara can tell you, you know, the pandemic has had, has had an impact. Um, so we're still doing a lot of, a lot of interviews, but obviously, you know, field work has been, you know, has been temporarily halted. Justin, how are you, how's your experience? Like, with, how's, how's the pandemic impacted your research? Yeah, just, I'm really working off of stuff I've already done in terms of interviews. I can't, I haven't done any field work since, I think, the yeah, 2019. I think I was, I was at um, UC Santa Barbara um, for most of last year. And then the pandemic hit us in March and California locked down immediately. So we were quarantined from March until June. So yes, I think most anthropologists now are really trying to figure out either digital ethnography, social media, because yeah, you can't really go in and interview people now. It's, it's unsafe. You put them at risk interviewing them. Yeah. I know. It's so funny you said field work. I accidentally just bumped into, after I, I knew that I was invited to participate in this incredible event tonight, I, I picked up just by mistake this uh, disc that I had laying down, field notes from 2010 from a trip I took to uh, to the Delta, and so I started out, you know, in High Springs, talking about the trip, and you know, like every couple of hours, I'm saying something. I went by Parchman Prison, I went to mm. Sumner, I got together with Margaret, and it was weird hearing myself talk about those things that happened on those trips a yeah. decade later. I had no idea that that even existed, but that, that comes from the Deborah file because somehow she must have saved it. Is the only reason I had a copy of it. <laughs> so, you know, once again, back to Deborah. Deborah is our institutional memory. I mean, right. <laughs> I mean, she reminds me of so many things we did. I'm like, we really did that? Yeah. Um, I didn't get the chance to share my favorite Margaret Block memory tonight, which was, um, and Marty, you've heard this before, but um, this was in between trips. And I was in the Delta and, and checked in on, on Margaret and she took, and she had one of her many um, goddaughters who was with her. You know. Margaret was a godparent for like scores and scores of people like Chris Austin, who's the chair of Black Studies at Oregon, uh, Akinelli Moja, the chair of Black Studies at, at Georgia State, right? But this one trip, I remember picking up Margaret and was with one of her goddaughters and we drove past Parchman. Oh, I know what it was. It was the 60th anniversary of the Freedom Rides. And we were there with this very small team to kind of document it. And we drove past Parchman and um, I've always been scared of that place, you know, as soon as I heard about it, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, we drove past there and Margaret said, stop the car. Mm -hmm. You stopped in the parking lot in front of Parchment. And uh, I said, well, let's, let's get a photograph of the, of the marquee. And Margaret said, you know, uh, one of my grand nephews is, uh, uh, knows the superintendent of prison. So we're gonna, I'm gonna take us into Parchment mm -hmm. and we're gonna do a tour. And uh, I said, Margaret, that's okay. <laughs> I, you know, she it was, she was insistent. So she goes up to the guard in the kiosk. And I was like, no, Margaret, don't do that. <laughs> They're all armed with machine guns and all this stuff, you know? And she goes and, and, and just talks to them for about three minutes. We were driving through the gates. I'd never been involved in such a thing in my entire life and just drove right into Parchment Prison with Margaret Block. <laughs> I mean, it was incredible, you know, and uh, they, the, the, uh, the, the assistant deputy warden, you know, took us around and showed us where the Freedom Riders had been incarcerated. And, um, you know, he, he mentioned a couple of times that, you know, it was unusual for uh, people to get a tour like this, uh, but because it was Margaret, uh, he had to relent because he got a call from his brother, the Mississippi Bureau of Prisons. So that <laughs> Margaret could open doors including the door to parchment prison. 
So Paul, um, I, did, I just want to, I know we're doing a different celebration tonight, but just the news about Judge Mickle yesterday was, you know, really, I'm so glad that we we're able to do what we did for him. But I mean, what, what do you even say? I'm even getting kind of choked up now talking about it. It's, have we reached out in any way to Mrs. Mickle as well to let the family know we're thinking about them? Or? We are going to, we um, had just saw, you know, Mrs. Mickle, we were in a program together, a virtual program, you know, no more than a month ago. Um, it was in December. And uh, so we are, you know, um, but we've lost so many friends, of course. Um, I was on the phone the other day with, um, you know, Mrs. Uh, Jean Chalmers, you know, David Chalmers passed away. Uh, David Colburn passed away, of course, you know, um, and so, yeah, but we're going to, we'll definitely, you know, put something together and I'll, I'll call uh, Evelyn. Um, and um, yeah. I really feel strongly that, you know, if we weren't doing what we're doing right now, we'd be rock going over with cornbread and, you know, red beans or something just to, just to be around them. I just want to make sure that they know that we're thinking about them. Yes. Definitely. Well, I don't want to keep you all because I know you all have like real lives um, outside of memory lane. So I'm still at school. <laughs> <laughs> You're actually, I think, are you in, are you in school right now? <laughs> yeah. Can you believe it? I'm at Oak Hall right now. All right. Yeah. And Omar is working on his senior thesis, even as we're talking, right? Time hey, congratulations. That's awesome. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm still working on that. We're getting ready for a public program. Uh, Omar is actually going to speak at it. Um, we've started a collaboration with the Latino Public Policy Institute, UCLA. And we're talking about the interviews we've done in Immokalee uh, and also with uh, Latinx healthcare workers and you know people defined as essential workers. Um, Sonia Diaz, who's one of my former students who founded that, that the center and UCLA is just a powerhouse. And uh, we're also gonna be working with um, uh, another dear friend, Maggie Rodriguez, who's um, a senior professor at um, UT Austin uh, J School. And the idea is to put together kind of a consortium on uh, Latino oral history in the Southeast, especially during the, the era of the pandemic. And, um, we're kind of we're using the Mississippi Freedom Project as a model, you know, to kind of maybe put together some kind of field work experience for people in Florida, you know, once we can do that again. Um, you know, and Justin will be calling on your your expertise to to kind of get that that up up and running. Um, Absolutely. I'm here. Okay. Deborah, how do you think it went? You guys still have attendees. Oh, we do. Well, this is the live workshop. We'll give them a good <laughs> okay, This is unplugged. Yeah, this is the second, the second CD. Hey, Jennifer, yeah. I see Jennifer Thaluzma. <laughs> I, I want to I want to give a shout out to Jennifer. Jennifer. How are you doing, Jennifer? It's great to see you. Emma Donnelly, Mr. Nelson, Kasamba, Michael Gendler, Nancy Hunt. Hey Nancy, my colleague from history, Nancy Hunt. Oliver Toulousma, Oliver, I got to apologize to you because um, we did get your video remembrance, but somehow it was one of the ones that didn't get put in, but we will be putting it in. We'll, we can use we it. We can put it in now. We can put it in now, <laughs> yeah. So Oliver, I hope, Oliver, are you in the third, are you a 3L now in law school? Are you, um, I don't know if you may be, be wait. Uh, Mr. Nelson said, He's at the dinner table still. <laughs> and we still have Sam Dixie on the um hey, oh, Sam. Really? Oh, Sam, how are you? Hey, Sam Dixie. And we just talked last weekend. And I, I hope uh you heard when we gave a kind of a um, memorialization of your parents. And when I first met uh Sam's parents, I just had to say this. Um I was in Tallahassee as a grad student. And we were working out of the offices of Florida a and And Professor James Eton was our supervisor. Sam knows Mr. Eton very well. Marna knows what I'm talking about. Uh, Professor Eton was the founder of the Black Archives at Florida a and a legendary uh, scholar. And 
the three person grad team, one day we realized we'd run out of interviews to do. And we asked Mr. Eton and he said, um, well, well, um, young scholars, it's, uh, your education begins today. You're going to actually have to, to create your own interviews. <laughs> so we're like, I actually went to a phone book. Remember what a phone book was, Marna? Um, oh, I still have phone books. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I I'm start OG, like, I'm OG. I should, you know, one of my former professors, Peter Wu, was on the line. I can say this now because Peter's off, but I wouldn't say it if he was still on the line. I started cold calling people. I remember um, I called the Office of the American Federation of State, County, Municipal Employees, you know, the AFSCME Trade Union. And I said, do you have any African-American elders or retirees that would be willing to, you know, tell their stories about, you know, growing up under segregation? And they said, oh, young man, you got to talk to Mrs. Laura Dixie. She was the founder of our union uh, in Florida, and she'll tell you anything you want to know. And so I called her on the phone and she invited me right in, like, right, she said, come over right now. And so I drove over. Um, uh, her and Mr. Dixie, her husband lived in, or, uh, you know, in the Jake Gaither neighborhood. Uh, and I mean, they were just incredible storytellers. They just literally, um, as Sam Jr. can tell you, they just adopted me. I mean, they took me in. Um, they insisted, by the way, that I stay with them um, after that first year, because I think the second year I was doing interviews and I started asking people in the area about the Ku Klux Klan. And I remember Sam Dixie Sr. called me one evening. He said, young man, uh, you've been asking questions that are really making a lot of white folk angry. Um, and so Mrs. Dixie and I would like you to come stay with us and um, for your duration of your field work here. I said, oh, oh, no, Mr. Dixie, that's OK. I can take care of myself. You know, here I'm an Army veteran and everything. He said, young man, you don't understand uh, this. Uh, where are you staying right now? I told him the Econo Lodge. He said, I'm going, I'm coming to pick you up. <laughs> so there was no option. It was like, we're going to pick you up and you're going to stay with us. And at that time, I didn't realize that they had actually um, really done the same thing with Dr. King. I mean, because the Dixie family had a reputation for, for defending themselves. And SCLC, which Mrs. Dixie was a, a lifetime member, um, that's where Dr. King went and stayed. Uh, was in the Dixie uh, household. Uh, and so um, I remember the, the, the other story about the Dixie family, which I think Sam Jr. was there when this happened, was um, one of Sam's uncles, um, A.I. Dixie, uh, who was a bit older than Sam Sr. A.I. was about six years older than Sam Sr., I think. And to see those two brothers when I interviewed them together, you know, and one was, you know, maybe like 85 and the other was 79. And I would ask him a question. Can you tell me where Quincy is? And, and A.I. Dixie would say, 20 miles west of Tallahassee. And Sam Jr. would, or Sam Sr. would say, yep, 20 miles west of Tallahassee. And they would kind of echo each other. And I remember they would call me when I was working on my first book, Emancipation Betrayed. And I was so frustrated and so frustrated. And Mr. And Mrs. Dix would actually call me and say, how is that book coming along, Paul? You know, uh, we want to host your first book talk. And so when the book finally did come out and they were so supportive, the first book reading I gave was actually in their home. And A.I. Dixie was there and he was 90 at the time, I think. And he started it off by telling us stories about mules and why it was important to understand the role of mules in farming rural communities. And I thought of Zora Neale Hurston's classic book, right? Mules and Men, the story about what, how people depended upon mules and why learning the personality of a mule was like so key to being able to survive. Um, and that was at the first reading I did of that book of Emancipation Betrayed was in, uh, it was in Sam's, uh, Sam and Laura Dixie's house. And of course, Sam Jr. now, I, Sam, I forgot to mention the fish fries and the barbecues that you've done for us. I, I apologize for that. We'll, we'll, we'll make sure and talk about that later. But um, anyway, y'all, I should get, get going. Um, got papers to grade. Got a three-hour grad seminar tomorrow. So 
Thank you everyone so much for, for being with so us. Great seeing you all.